kilometer long they left on Saturday. I took them to the airport so they could go to Texas, and Jan said we're going to join them there for a family wedding that's going to happen in Corpus Christi. And while we will see them soon, I still struggle with this issue of parting and how to deal with the separation. Maybe some of you have that trouble as well. <clears throat> so while we'll see them soon, we think about how we can deal with that pain. One way is to remember when we're going to next be together. Another way is to think about the fact that we still love each other even though we're not close. Or perhaps we'll figure out a way to be in communication as we're apart. Today, I'd ask you to think about ways that we say goodbye and how we stay in touch with relationships with people who have gone somewhere else. In today's gospel, Jesus knew that he was going to be leaving the apostles. He was concerned about what was going to happen to them, and so he offered them a gift to help them as they went through the separation that they would experience. And he spoke specifically about the Holy Spirit coming to be with them, to help them to deal with this loss that they were going to experience. Today is Trinity Sunday. And I would suggest to you that the Trinity is one way for us to deal with the fact that Jesus is no longer present on earth in a physical form. On Trinity Sunday, we celebrate all three persons of God. By the way, my clergy friends usually think that this is the hardest sermon for anyone ever to give. <laughs> they think that because, and I sometimes agree with them, they think that because the, the theology of the Trinity is complex and sometimes hard for people to deal with. So the question is, how do we make sense out of one God and three persons of the Trinity? And my suggestion to you is that as we go through this day that you and discussion that you focus on the unity of God, the, the singleness of God, even though we have three persons. Now, in the early Christian church, it took quite a while for them to get to the point where they could say, we know what the Trinity means. They debated it for centuries, actually. They argued about what Jesus, who Jesus really was, what was his relationship with the Father, who is this Holy Spirit? It wasn't until they had a council in 325, the one in Nicaea, and then later they had another council in 381 in Constantinople, and that's when they finally wrote down the theology of the Trinity, what it really means to us. It was then recognized as the belief of the whole church. Now, one of the reasons that perhaps they struggled a little bit is that if you look through Scripture, you don't find an explanation of the Trinity. In fact, you won't even see the word Trinity in any part of Scripture. But we do have lots of times in Scripture when we hear or read about each of the three persons. So last week, for example, we celebrated the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast, I think, of the Holy Spirit. And I shared with you that there's lots of places in Scripture where we hear about the Spirit of God, the breath of God, coming down. This happens in the Hebrew Scriptures, what we might refer to as the Old Testament. And then, in today's Gospel, we hear about the Holy Spirit as well. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come after he ascended into heaven. And whoever wrote the, the Gospel of John, maybe it was John, really thought that this was important for us to hear because there's actually five different times in the Gospel of John that you can read about the Holy Spirit coming to be with us. It's an important part of the theology that we find in John. As I said, I think Jesus was wanting to help all those people that he was leaving behind, and help us too, to deal with the fact that he's not present with us physically. But lots of people have experienced God's presence in their lives, that he's not here. And so one of the ways that we deal with that is to lean on the power of the Holy Spirit. To know, help us to know that God is present with us. Always. Now the New Testament scripture doesn't speak specifically about the Trinity either. But once again we have references to all three persons. And we're pretty 
lucky today because we got to read one from Romans today, just five verses in that particular passage, but it mentions all three of the persons of the Trinity in this one short passage. And I like the way that Paul describes God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, for he wrote that Jesus brings us God's peace. And Paul wrote that the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. Three persons working together to be with us. It's not the only passage in, in the New Testament. Here's another example in the Gospel of Matthew. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All three persons mentioned in Scripture, spoken about, shared with us. Now, as human, humans, we always like to try and figure out a way to describe or explain logically the Trinity. Whenever we do, we use human terms to try and make that happen. I'm not sure it ever works, but we try. I'm sure you've probably heard someone give a sermon where they said, they used the analogy of a three-legged stool. There's only one stool with three legs. Maybe that's helpful for you to understand the Trinity. St. Patrick, when he was helping the people of Ireland, he shared with them about the Trinity by describing, by using a tiny little plant, the shamrock. Three leaves, one plant. This week I kind of like, maybe next week I'll think of something else, but this week I kind of like the idea of the elements that are found in the periodic table. You say, what the heck does that mean? But you know that every atom has a certain number of protons or neutrons or electrons. And every element that's in a periodic table has a specific number of those. So the carbon atom can only be carbon if it has a certain number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So that helps me this week to think about the fact that God is only God because the three persons have come to, together in one to be one. Now there's one last way that I think I like to think about what the Trinity means. And it, and it comes from the fact that each of us has a different personas that we share. So I'm like that. I'm a father, a husband, a grandfather, a priest, a friend. And sometimes I'm called other things at once. <laughs> <laughs> and so, my daughter Jenny calls me dad. Evelyn calls me grandfather, or grandpa. Jan calls me husband. Some of you call me father, or pastor, or whatever. And my friends call me to play golf. <laughs> In each of those spaces, I'm not exactly the same person. I'm a little different, and yet I am Father, just me, one person. A little different, but the same. For me, that's the best way in human terms that I can describe what the Trinity is like. And sometimes we look into Scripture and we try to explain God as the Trinity by looking at the characteristics of God, and we got that today too. I love this passage we had from Proverbs today where it describes wisdom. Wisdom, by the way, is described in feminine terms. I'll mention that a little bit later, too. But specifically, we are told that wisdom existed for all time, that God established wisdom forever. And that wisdom fits into the idea of the Trinity because we know that wisdom is found in the Word of God in the Scriptures of East Year. And we know that John told us this, that Jesus is the Word of God. And then, in the psalm, God is called governor. God is also called the creator. God is the all-powerful one. In this passage we had from Romans today, God is referred to as peace, as well as the one who gives us grace and love. And Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as the gift of truth. All of these characteristics or attributes are used to describe the Trinity. And sometimes we want to apply one of those characteristics to just one member of the Trinity. But the truth is that I think all these descriptions, every attempt that we make as humans, always fall short. The Trinity is a mystery. 
It's something that we want to understand and can never explain exactly how it works. Mm. I like to think about that Trinity as an effort on God's part to make sure that we have every opportunity to be in relationship with God. But for some of us, and on some days, we may wish, we may seek out God mm. by praying to the Holy Spirit. And that works. Or perhaps you can best find God by reaching out to Jesus. Others of us want to seek God by reaching out to God the Father, by praying to God the Father. And the truth is, all three of those work. The same one God, all together. And we have lots of experience to understand how God works as one. Jesus said it lots and lots of times. God, you are one with me, and I am one with you. And even in today's gospel, we experience that. For Jesus said that the Holy Spirit says what I would say. The Holy Spirit says what God the Father would say. All one coming to us. I'm pretty blessed because lots of people in this congregation share their experiences with me, share their theology, share their spirituality, share their readings. And that happened for me too this week. For someone loaned me a book about the Trinity. It was written in 2013 by a lady whose name is Cynthia Bourgeois. Man knows who that is. <laughs> and just in describing the fact that she wrote that book in 2013 means that I want to share with you the talented theologians, even to this day, are trying to help us better understand the Trinity. They, we don't give up. And it also says to us that there's still more for us to learn, always more for us to learn about what the Trinity is. Now the book that she wrote is titled The Holy Trinity and the Law of Three. I am not an expert on this book. And I cannot explain everything that is in it to you. But there are a couple of pieces that I picked up. And I'd like to share some of them. The first is that she mentioned that sometimes in today's world, people refer to the Holy Trinity, to the Holy Spirit, in feminine terms. And she says, you know, it's nice that we care about the femininity, femininity of God, but the truth is that we can't place God in any gender. God is a male, God is a female. And I also learned that three is a powerful number. Three is a powerful number for us in our spiritual lives. But we think about the power, we can think about the power of three in our normal lives as well. You know, so many times we put things in polar opposites. We say it's either night or day, it's yes or no, male or female. And yet, if we add a third, it can be so much more. Three can create balance. So, for example, we may take a certain position and another person may take it an opposite position, in agreement or disagreement. And yet it can be even made better, bigger, if we add a third, if we add a reconciling force to balance those two opposites. Three can create new energy. We often speak about creating a plant by putting a seed into the earth. <laughs> but the truth is that it probably won't grow into a plant unless we add something, a third piece usually water. It's also true that we need flour and water in order to make something, but together they don't make bread unless we add heat to it, a third. Or perhaps we might think of a plaintiff or a defendant in this case, and they argue about who is right, but truly they don't come to an agreement until the judge comes along or the jury comes along and helps us to decide. A third piece and that's what this author, Cynthia Bourgeois, was teaching us. That the Trinity is a powerful thing. The three becomes a powerful thing for us. The strength of three. And so we pray that we can be made alive in the strength, the love, and the peace of the three persons of God, all one working together. In Scripture today, we can find specific words about each person. So we can learn that Jesus, the Son, is the eternal Word. We can hear that God the Father is the Creator and the one who sent Jesus to be with us. 
or we can experience God as the Holy Spirit who opens our hearts and minds. But for me, I suggest to you that we do our best when we don't try to explain exactly what the Trinity is or how they work together. I find it better to simply accept the Trinity as three who want to be working in our lives. We don't need to explain why they're different and yet the same. We just need to remember that they work in perfect unity. And we wish for ourselves that we can find that unity, sometimes in ourselves, sometimes with others. Because God's Trinity can bring us a peace. There's a Presbyterian minister whose name is William Dixon Gray, and he talked about the Trinity this way. He said, rather than explaining the Trinity, let the Trinity explain us. And he said that because he said, we are always changing from what we are to what we are becoming. And the Trinity doesn't allow things to be static. God is active in the world today. God is active in our lives. And that's how God, the Trinity, explains us. Helping us to change and become closer to God all the time. I hope that today you'll try to decide that rather than to think about the Trinity, you'll try to feel the Trinity. At work in your life. I'm as guilty as so many other people. I try to put the Trinity in the individual boxes. So many times I've called God the Father the Creator, God the Son as the Redeemer, and God the Holy Spirit.